Hey, folks. Ready? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Hello out there in Packer Nation. Welcome to another edition of the Absolute Packer Podcast. We're on episode 51. Uh, we are... I had a total brain fart there. I'll have to keep going. We are glad and happy and elated to have uh, Jeremy back with us. He's been gone. It felt hey. like he's been gone for like six weeks but it actually hasn't been that long it's just been a couple <laughs> but um we recorded one podcast it, uh with, without him while he was down in florida doing some stuff um but he's back so good to have you back bud good to be back guys yeah. we're in the thick of the off season it's getting closer to the end here thank goodness we're coming up on training camp soon so we don't have to sit here twiddling our thumbs and trying to think of topics to come up with hopefully a lot more of them will come to us uh, rather than us trying to manufacture things, although it is a you know 365, 24/7, 365 type league, so there is always stuff to talk about. Um, so it's getting a little late for us. We had a couple of little technical difficulties that we got through, and it's getting late on our end. It's in fact it's past my bedtime, so let's just plow through this some bit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so the biggest thing to discuss is the Packers released their financials the other day. Um, they're the only publicly traded professional sports franchise. So they're the only you know team out there in the world that basically has to report financial dealings and have them become public, which is unique and interesting. Um, you can learn some stuff from it, I think. Um, but some of it's just, uh, I don't want to say playing around with numbers, but let's just say what it is. Some of it is kind of playing around with numbers, but I just wanted to go over some of the highlights and then we can kind of discuss in a little bit more detail. So, um, Profit from operations, and this information is pulled right from the Packers site. So right. profit from operations fell from $34 million a year ago to just 724000 for the fiscal year that ended in March 31st, 2019, a decline of 98%. While revenues increased to healthy $23 million at a substantially greater rate, I think, an increase of more than $56 million in expenses. 13% was due mainly to three factors, significant player contracts, the overhaul of the coaching staff. And this is interesting. And I did not know about this, you know, the details of it, but third part was the team's obligations to the concussion liability reserve, which funds the legal settlement being drawn upon by former players. Very interesting. I mean, I think that's good, but you know, it's obviously, I think it's probably one of those expenses that I don't know how long they've been doing it. It can't be that long. And there's a good chunk of money in there. So oh. anyway, real quick, sorry. Total revenues reached $477.9 million with total expenses at $477.2 million. So basically they broke even if you look at it from that perspective. Um, anyway, um, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't pretend to be an accountant. I don't a financial guru. Uh, so I'm probably going to have to defer to when I like Christian sit on this because I know he loves this type of stuff. Um, but no, I mean, it, all kidding aside, just kind of open up to both you guys, Jeremy and Elliot. Uh, you know, what do you think of this? I think it's much to do about nothing. Yeah, I, <laughs> all right. think, I think the same. Yeah. Um, but I think when you kind of look at the big picture, it just goes to show you that the Packers need to win to be financially viable. You know, because they are there, there we own them pretty much. You know, the community here owns them. Uh, it's very important for them, even though they do get part of the collective bargaining. You know that the every team pours in, and uh, all the profits get shared amongst all thirty-two teams. Uh, we still are viable because we are doing well, or we we were doing well in the past, and we were able to. Uh, keep money in the reserve to sign people like Aaron Rodgers and to sign Zadarius Smith and Preston Smith this off season. So mm. it, it's important for the Packers to be financially viable. And I, it, this kind of shows you that the direct effect and cause when they do poorly. No doubt. That's a good I, point. Cause they had a losing season last year. I didn't even really oh, bring up on the field, but nonetheless, but, but, but the revenue is up. So that's not true. That's just not true. So we don't know how big this concussion thing was, like per team and per year or anything. Yeah. So like the other teams could be like, they could be a net 
loss every they could be the net loss this year and they're mm. not disclosing their financials so i i just exactly I, yeah it, I, I, I you have to consider the fact nothing it is but i mean you have to consider the fact that they just spent a hundred million dollars in aaron Rodgers. that money doesn't just come from nowhere so that comes off of the ability for them to be profitable because the money that they make in the profit has to be tied back into all of this so um, it's, it's huge. It, it, yeah, it but ties it, it, back. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I mean, so they're like the signing bonuses and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I get that. Cause, but there is that salary cap that kind of, mm-hmm. you know, helps temper that a little bit across the teams and the so, revenue sharing. I think yeah. I, I didn't mention it in there, but I can't remember how much money they got that each team starts out with, you know, they basically start out at, you know, not zero. They all start out at like X amount of hundred. shame on me for not having the number in front of me, but they're not starting out it's actually a heck of a lot more than that because they get, you know, tens of millions, if not even, you know, hundreds of millions. I, I, I think it's between, from the, from the revenue sharing between all from the revenue, from the revenue sharing. It's between somewhere between 100 and 200 million. Yeah. I don't remember the exact figure, mm-hmm. but per team, per team, per team. Yeah. It okay. sounds about right. I was going to say about 150 million, which nothing to sneeze at. You know, what's interesting. No. Um, now the reserve fund, they call it, I call it the rainy day fund or whatever you want to call that. I want to say they have close to, if the last time I, I checked on what that number was, it's close to $500 million, I think. And I guess the Packers, if you look at it from their perspective, you know, say you have a strike, say you have, you know, a work stoppage, how yep. fast do you think they could blow through that cash? <laughs> they, they've said that they want their general fund to pretty much fund themselves for one season. Perfect. So that's Perfect. how much yep. for and how long it'll last. Yep. Isn't that yeah. interesting? Yeah. Yeah. Damn near 500 million. And, and if that, does that equate to one season? Yeah, yeah, it does. Oh, cause you, you rattled off the numbers. Their revenue is 477.9 million. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And we've been crying about needing to to venture into free agency, and this is <laughs> this is part of their uh, part of the drawback of of uh, yeah. parlaying a free agency because they had to hand uh, well over fifty million dollars in signing bonuses and guaranteed money that mm-hmm. all comes from the general fund. Right. And when they right. said there was coaching turnover, you know, I'm, I got to mean think a lot yeah. of that yeah. is buyouts of old coaches. Yeah, yep. not just sal- salaries of new coaches, and then you know whatever happens in between there. So, yep. Yep. Uh, it, you know, like I said, if anything, it's interesting when the Packers release this information. But to your point, Elliot and and Jeremy, I mean, how much does it really tell you? Not a whole lot. It's kind of a shell game in some respects. Well, uh, it it doesn't it doesn't tell us much because nobody else re- 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 exactly. There's nothing. There's that. nothing to compare it to. <laughs> right. It's, it's numbers in a vacuum in a way. <laughs> right. You know. Right. So yeah, what what are the other teams? I mean, like if Google releases their numbers and Microsoft releases their numbers, there's a discussion to be had, right? But like mm-hmm. if if the Packers release their numbers, but the the Cowboys or the Bears don't, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. And you know yeah. what's funny is when you think about it. So the Packers are the smallest market professional sports team in professional sports. Obviously, number thirty-two is not. Well. Um, so I, where I'm going is, you know, the picture of their quote unquote financial health, whether it's revenue, profit, you know, expenses, all that, if they're number 32, you know, supposedly, um, just all things considered, do they, do they appear pretty healthy and how, how are things going there? (laughs) You know, things are going well for the league, you know, you can think. They're they're not not number number 32 32 revenue, 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 revenue split split through the the TV and everything everything like that. I mean, that, I mean, that's potentially right, right. Because, 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 you know, we had, we had to deal with our local media market, market to home to and that. We can push them up short, right? right. But, Audio got very funky there. I don't know yeah. if you guys oh, heard oh, that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're just, you're just bad bad that kind of that way, too. That's why we're using Zencaster. Oh, okay. It sounds... Sounds very. Yeah, they're not. If I was making weird faces, it wasn't because I was touching myself or anything. It just sounded <laughs> strange. <laughs> Go right ahead, Andy. <laughs> don't just pass my bedtime. I'm having I'm having dreams while I'm awake. Oh my god. I, well, we don't want to know what you do in bed. So. <laughs> or, or, or or do we? You know, it is the off season. We need to we need to goose our ratings. So. <laughs> goose our ratings, nice. I'm not going to release any financials, so don't don't. Uh... Don't don't hold your breath on that. No, how much do you how much do you get paid in bed? Well, a nickel. 
<laughs> it's the only thing I can come up with. I was not prepared yeah. for that. I was not, not, I, no, to, to quote, what was it, Chevy Chase and Sunday Night Live? He's like, I was not aware that there would be any math in this. Uh, all right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if there's really much else to say about uh, financials. Um, well, you know what would be interesting? And I mean, this is totally hypothetical, but I would love to see the financials of, say, the Dallas Cowboys. Mm hmm at one point just to see what the hell they are at um because who the hell knows you know well, i feel like they're the only i don't know i, 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 I feel like they're the most terrible terrible team cowboys yeah because yeah, they, they have, have fans, fans all, all, over. all over yeah more, more, more than, than others, others you know so, you know, so like, like i'd like, like to know, know if they're higher 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 higher, 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 higher uh, uh, you know um uh, you know i'd like to know yeah that'd be great that'd be great yeah okay that's fair enough. Because, um, like, what other... I mean, maybe the Patriots? Who the hell knows? I but... was going to mention the Patriots. That would be the next... This, this is the APP podcast. The absolute... We'll Patriots see. Podcast. We'll see. No. You know, I would love to I would love to, to uh, hear hear from you guys, like, uh, uh, once Brady leaves, which could be, you know, <laughs> halfway through this year, the end of this year, whatever, like... Or 10 like, years from now at this rate. But, like, when he leaves, like, are they going to drop back into obscurity or or is Belichick, like, just the the Zen master and he's just going to be able to propel? You know when Brady stuff? leaves that Belichick's going to retire. How could he not? He's been, I don't know, maybe I'm dead wrong. Maybe he is even more of a genius than I thought. But I digress. See how many topics we have? So many. Unlimited. <laughs> Ridiculous. Ridiculous. All righty. Unless you guys have any other comments on that, I think we can no, probably no, no, move on from no, that. Otherwise, good. we could just yeah. kind of just kind of throw numbers out there and make up our own, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I know what I was going to say real quick. I'm sorry. Um, so that con that concussion settlement fund, I'd be curious to know what that looks like. Might have to do right. a little bit of research to see yeah. how much of that is available. And that's yeah. just more of a general thing, not just for Packers financials. I, I'm curious to see what that would be. Yeah, and I would too. The only thing that I've read about that is that, um, because I follow their page on Twitter. Um, I think it's called uh, NFL's Concussion Settlement Committee or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they've handed out well over $500 million in settlement money okay. for people that have had um, oh. issues with concussions after their after their career was over. Going back how far, though? How long? I don't remember. Yeah, is that because I get what I'm getting at is, is that 500 million over the past three years? Over the no, past no, 10 years, I think it's been, past... I think it's been since they signed the agreement. Oh, that's 2010. So we're talking damn near 10 years. Okay. 10 years. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Oh that's... no. Look at. Oh, oh, who's that? Here, look at. <gasps> hey, <laughs> yes. Hey, who hey, are you? Donald. Hey, Donald. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, uh, here, yeah. here. I'll put your I'll put your headphones on. Here, cool. They're talking to you. Hi. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Hi. We have. Hey, this is our first guest. Yes. First guest of 2019. Would Can you like you to be interviewed? Me? All right. What's your name? Zoe. Zoe. That's a fantastic name. Thank you. It's a lovely name. <laughs> You're welcome. How old are you, Zoe? Five. Five. No. Wait. How many years have you been a Packer fan? Uh, forever. Yeah. <laughs> that a girl. <laughs> I I have a daughter named Evelyn, and she's 10. So she's Ooh. actually twice as old as you. And, and I have uh, um, a friend that, that, is the, that, that is a house next to us. And, is she a Packer and, fan? I don't know. How do you not know? <laughs> we gotta find out. I never asked. The hard-hitting question. What? What do you talk about? I never <laughs> asked. Oh my her. gosh! You don't talk to her about the CBA. Right. Show, no. go pack, go. You gotta okay. show, go pack, go into the microphone. Say, go pack, go. Go Packers, go! That a girl, Zoe. <laughs> All right, our first interview. <laughs> it's to nice to meet you. Yeah, that was outstanding. That's that awesome. made it. That was that was one of the coolest things I've ever seen in this whole entire podcast. Oh, that was, that was awesome. outstanding. Thank you. Yeah. So well, we do. We, that, we have an inter we have an interview was, under our belt. Kind of intimidating. That, that was Gina. You know, we did interviews before, idiot. 
<laughs> I meant first inter- I meant first interview of the year. I'm not that dumb. Of the year, I, or season, whatever. Off oh, season, the, season. Okay, whatever. okay, 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 okay. Guys, I am burning through the cash in the rainy day fund up in here, up in my brain. Okay, so <laughs> every every second we're going through there. Actually, this is a good segue. We talk about we've done more inter- interviews and all that kind of stuff because um, this next topic is more or less it's it's kind of a general super specific to what's going on now but i've seen a lot of it on twitter and that is my boy Devonte adams who um uh, full disclosure jeremy and i were talking before we started recording and you might have heard some of this elliot but i don't remember him after my sickness i didn't know who he was i don't remember the beginning of his career the only memories i have of him were the beginning of last season to now which is strange but i literally don't remember anything and he was telling me how Right. He really struggled with the drops, and he had a really difficult first couple of years, and, you know, I don't remember any of that. But long story short, he had a fantastic year last year, and he had a fantastic year even before that, which I believe was, was, that was his first year of his new contract or was last year? The, last year was his first year. Last year was a first-year extension. Okay. He signed uh-huh. it, like, uh, towards the end of last year. Okay. I got you. I got you. Um, but anyway, th- there's been a lot of talk in the off season with him in regards to it's kind of this chicken and the egg thing. And, you know, has Ro- you know, did Rogers make Jennings? Did Rogers make Nelson or, you know, how good, how much is Devonte himself and how much is Aaron Rodgers? Cause I've seen a lot of stuff going back and forth on Twitter about, um, with Devonte Adams, you know, his PFF grades and even just, um, fantasy football type stuff. And full disclosure, I've never been a part of any kind of fantasy football type thing, but it just puts in tons and tons of discussion on there. And, uh, apparently I ate a bunch of crow on Devonte Adams cause I used to call him drop Vontae. <laughs> it's what I was told. I, somebody told me it might've been you guys. And I don't yeah. even remember that. So yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Devonte. Um, and he, he was outstanding last year and, um, now, is Rodgers make a lot of the, the players look good? Yes, but I have eyes and I have new memories. And I what I saw last year from him was outstanding. And he was basically, when he's the only weapon, I don't want to say the only weapon, but the main weapon, and people know he's going to get fed the ball and you still dominate, I think that tells you pretty much everything you need to know yeah. about the talent of said wide receiver. Again, it's, so in my mind, what I'm getting at there is I think it's kind of both, you know, obviously. Uh, right. Devontae. He yeah. he improved. He got a hell of a lot better. Um, who knows where the light bulb actually came on? But um, and I don't remember um, all the cash. Like I said, the reserve cash burned through. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to kind of bring that up and just see your guys' thoughts on him. And you know, has he hit his ceiling? Can he get even better? And you know, me personally, just real quick before I pass along, I think he can get a heck of a lot better because now he's in a more dynamic, brand new offense. Mm-hmm. Hopefully. And let and let me add this: um, Aaron Rodgers doesn't beat double teams. Devonte Adams did, so <laughs> Rodgers has everything to do with, you know, getting the ball in a certain you know neck of the woods, whatever it's here, here, whatever. I mean, he he's responsible for that, but he is not responsible for beating the double teams, which Devonte Adams beat very on a regular basis last year. Um, talking about uh, Devonte Adams when he first was was brought in, in 2014, uh, his first year, I mean, he had uh, almost, I'm pretty sure it was like close to double digit drops. And then his second year was just as bad. Um, and there was some very hard, uh, or harsh things, I, I should say, uh, being said about him and the, from the fan base and from um, all the media uh, that pretty much said he's if he can't catch the ball, he's worth nothing. Um, so, you know what? He took it upon himself to work in the offseason and work during the season, whatever it, it is, to get to the point where he's a top five receiver. That has everything to do with Devontae Adams. Aaron Rodgers has everything to do with getting the ball to him, but everything else in the whole scope of things is Devontae Adams finally seeing the light and finally just, you know, that talent finally being, uh, uh, uncapped, you know, and, and being mm. brought out. So, um, that's all, you know, kudos to him for working through the, the tough part of his earlier career. I mean, Jamon Moore is a very similar guy. Uh, the Packers second year receiver that they drafted in the fourth round last year, very similar. Um, I see a very similar path with him, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, as he gets better here and, and uh, progresses in his, into his career. 
Um, so can he get better? Is it, did, has he reached a ceiling? I don't think his ceiling has been reached yet. I mm-hmm. truly don't. I think he can get better. Um, I think what can make him get better is that he has more help around him, uh, more talent that can take the attention away from him, but also the offense, uh, being able to scheme him open, um, and, and getting the ball in his hands more often. That's all going to play a huge role in him, hopefully even going beyond last year's, uh, great statistical year. Yeah. Very well said. You know, he had great statistics, but he also, man, uh, he, him coming off the line is pretty ridiculous to see his footwork and how he's breaking ankles out there, man alive. You know, who used to be the best at that was Greg Jennings. Greg Jennings. Yeah. And I'm telling you, Devontae Adams is like, when you put them side by side, you know, and look at, look at their, their moves off the line and whatnot. Devonte Adams is is like twice. It, 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 he seems like he's twice as good, twice as shifty, twice as smooth. And it, well, that is saying something. Let's just say it right now. Devonte Adams, his feet as a whole are the best that we've seen uh, in the in the past few decades in Packer history. I mean, That's there's true. nobody that can touch his feet and be able to just shift on a dime and get open um, because a cornerback breaks his ankle. You know, just yeah. because he's it that something. It's it's people. unbelievable. Yeah, he kills people off the line because he's not the fastest guy. No. But he just precision route runner and, and just an unbelievable off the line. So, yeah, kudos to him. I don't know if you guys have anything necessarily any more on that, but I did want to. Not really. No. I thought it was a good. You know, I, I guess. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Go get oh. Zoe. we got to find out what she wants, what she well, thinks. Well, yeah. I mean, she's she's all in on Donald Driver. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong yeah. with that. Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add is, I mean, that's all true, right? Everything you said is true. Uh, fast feet, um, you know, probably not the fastest off the line. But, um, you know, I guess, you know, I always have a hard time discerning who you attribute the credit to totally, right? And, I mean, I guess that, that's why it's a fun discussion. But, um when we keep seeing, you know, receivers having good success with Rodgers, I mean, I don't know. I, I think you have to give some of that back to Rodgers. So. Oh, no doubt. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. So, I, I think it is. I, mean. I think it is kind of with Devontae. That's a, that's a really good point. Like, where does it start and end? I don't think it's like 85 Rodgers, 15, you know, Devontae. I think it's more so uh, probably 50-50, if not, you know, it, it's kind mm-hmm. of equal split there. You know, I like, wouldn't say 50-50, no. No. I think 75 25. I mean, you know what? Devontae came into the league. Zoe, we need he, Zoe to break the tie. <laughs> Devontae came into the league, okay? And he was a very good receiver. He came from Jeff Tedford's offense in Fresno State, who is a high octane pass. Wait, Jeff Tedford? Down. I thought he was at Cal. Oh. He was at Fresno State when um, uh, Devontae Adams was there. Oh, because he was, wasn't he um, Rogers' coach at Cal? Mm-hmm. But then he left and he went to Fresno State? Mm-hmm. Is that right? I, I think he was fired, actually. Okay. Because I was in a coma. Anyway, continue. Well, to, to kind How of... Many decades, 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 How many decades, 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 decades was this coma? coma? What's that? How many decades, decades long was this, was this coma? coma? Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, the beauty of it is you can bring it up all the time. You know, you can use it as a crutch whenever. It was a short little memory. You know your check bounced, Andy. You didn't have the funds in the account. <laughs> I was in a coma! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Continue. Yeah. Stay on target. Stay on track. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> coming coming into the league, he had the the, the strongest part of his game was his feet. Um, okay. He was very. Um, I think he caught well over 100 balls in three out of his four seasons that he played, or two out of his three, or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. The majority of the seasons he played, he had over 100 catches. Um, but his feet was his strong suit. And I remember going back and actually watching games of him at Fresno State on YouTube, and it's night and day that a guy that came in the league is probably the best feat of the whole wide receiver class. And now has gotten even better than that mm, with his feet. Great. So um, he Kudos puts on him. a clinic. That's, that's, that's all him. And that's why yeah. I say it's probably closer to an 80, 20 uh, Adams uh, Rogers mix because um, everything that he's done to make himself elite, that's all on him. Yeah. You know, Aaron Rodgers just gives him the ball. 
Aaron Rodgers puts him in position to, to make plays on his little audibles. Hopefully we don't see too many of that or too much of that happening this year. But I mean, you know, he, he puts uh, the ball where it needs to be. That's, that's his job. And he, and he probably tells Devante where he wants him to go if a play breaks down and so on and so forth. So there's probably a really good uh, connection and camaraderie amongst the two, but like, um, you know, in the off season, it, it sounds like he worked t- uh, really, really hard um, in the off seasons previous, just like uh, MVS now is working really hard with Randy Moss. Um, what I heard that today. So, um, you know, that's all attributed to uh, Devonte committing himself to it and, and saying that he's going to be a top five player and putting his mouth where his money is. And he's, he's there. He's there. Yeah, No doubt. No, I think that's a good spot to to leave it on there. So I think uh, he hasn't hit his ceiling. I think he could be better. And I think the scheme is the thing that's going to make him even better, to be honest with you, in right. addition to his some of his talent. Okay, right. so another off-season topic here that uh, has been kind of going on. Same thing in the Twitterverse, people bringing up a lot. Uh, and it's more prescient right now because um, we've got a new uh, offensive system in here, and that's the Packers offensive line. Um David Bakhtiari, I think he was graded the best pass blocking left tackle, might be over the past two years, if not. Um, but last year he was, and this is by PFF and a lot of the pundits. Um, and the Packers offensive line in general last year collectively was graded as the best pass blocking offensive line in the league. It, <laughs> I know Jeremy's laughing. Here. And now this is statistics type stuff. But the, right. uh, where, where things get hazy and where the stats tend to lie is in the results on the field. Mm-hmm. You know, where I'm getting at it, I mean, last year, Rodgers, it turns out he was hurt more than he let on. You know, he had the he had the tibular fracture or something like that, in addition to having that MCL uh, tear and whatnot. So he was he was kind of hobbling around on one leg and mm-hmm. who the heck knows. But, you know, he was waiting. We know what Rodgers does. A lot of times he runs around and makes something happen. And that makes your offensive line have to sit there and block for what should be max three seconds. They're going five, six, seven. So. Um, they, they could even the best pass block blocking offensive line in the league. You ask them to go longer than three seconds. That's a recipe for disaster. And they were asked to do it. What appeared to be 50% of every game, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's just strange to look at that. But, um, you know, the other thing that was interesting and it wasn't just Bakhtiari that was bringing him up. Um, Brian Bulaga was rated, uh, really as well, but, um, but when he was out there, he was he played really, really well. So mm-hmm. I'm just I you know, I guess the discussion point is, you know, how what will this offensive line look like coming into this year in a new scheme and just talking about how good were are they working with a quarterback like Rodgers? I think it's a fascinating dynamic. And I think that Rodgers makes them look bad a lot, to be perfectly mm-hmm. honest, because he's not. He's not a guy who's sitting in the pocket going back, picking you apart, you know, five step drop, boom, get it out. He, in a way, in a lot of ways, it seems like he's setting them up to fail. I mean, that's a, maybe that's a naive way of looking at it for someone like me who doesn't know all the ins and outs of football. But I think it's just interesting that they're the best pass blocking, statistically speaking, offensive line. Yet my eyes go, didn't seem that way, (laughs) you know? So what? Anyway, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Yeah, last year was a culmination of um, an offense that, as we talked about in the past, has, was very stale, very stagnant, the same old running 15-yard patterns downfield and waiting for them to get open. Um, and also, too, uh, the line did uh, block poorly because if you remember the very first game of the season uh, against the Chicago Bears, Aaron hurt his knee because Justin McCray missed a block. Um, so, uh, and, and Justin McCray gave up five sacks last year. So, and his limited playing time. So, um, to say that they're the best pass blocking team in the league, um, under two seconds. Okay. I can see that. But, um, this offense, I think, like I said, we're going to see a completely different offense where it's going to be very fast paced, uh, quick oriented, uh, one, you know, three step drops, making a throw, making a read, um, and, that's going to help the offensive line in general. Also, we're going to incorporate the running game, which uh, any good NFL knowledgeable person knows the running game sets up the pass. Um, so that's going to help the pass rush. <laughs> yeah. Unlike McCarthy. I mean, I know. Um, well, but- McCarthy, it was passed to set up the pass. <laughs> 
But he did say, uh, and I don't remember when it was or where, but he did say that the pass should set up the run. And I was like, that is backwards. Because if you're not consistently hitting the pass, how is that going to help the run? Because the line is, or the defense is still going to cl- uh, clog the line. And, you know, uh, they're, they're going to, you know, dominate you on every down without a running mm-hmm. game. So uh, that's just completely false. But like, um, you know, they gave up 53 sacks last year. Um, and you can attribute probably a good chunk of them to Aaron trying to t- uh, make extra time and find the, the open receiver because the play calls were all downfield. Um, and that's what happens when you don't have a, um, an exit route, you know, where you can hopefully, if your, your, your hot read and your two read and your three read aren't open, hopefully your fourth read is open because he's running a safe conservative route that makes him open, you know, over the middle or, um, you know, something dumped off or whatever to a running back. Um, that all helps. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you, but you bring up a really good point there. Uh, and I just want to make sure I got this one in it. It's, there were so many times where Rogers could have dumped it down. Oh yeah. Dumped down so many times. Like, multiple times per game where he could have just outletted five yards to a guy who was quote unquote wide open. And he never took that. Aaron Jones would have had 80 catches if, if if he took the check downs from Aaron or if Aaron actually saw him and and made the attempt to throw to him. I mean, look, the Seattle game, we we were all watching together. He Mm. had him on a handful of plays underneath and he just refused to throw it to him. And we, I, we better not see that kind of crap this year. You know, I, I will go out and say that we will not see that. Um, if we do, then we have a problem because, <laughs> you know, we're back to square, we're back uh, to square root one. But like it, that should not happen this year. Um, if anybody has gone back and watch the Tennessee offense from last year, even though they do not have a, a dynamic quarterback, um, they do have a pretty solid nucleus around Mariota um, that it made them OK. But if they had better talent, that offense would have been top 10 in the league, you know. Um, So I see a lot of positives into what is going to happen this year with the offense just because of the the philosophy that LeFleur is going to bring in where he wants the ball getting rid of, uh, you know, quickly. Uh, He doesn't want Aaron sitting back and taking hits, and he wants to uh, use the running game to take the pressure off of the whole offensive and offensive line. So, yeah. But okay, so so but but it sounds like you're saying that Bakhtiari is not the best in the league. No, 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 no. I will say I this. He is. And I'm saying pass blocking, not not run blocking, pass blocking. No. Pass blocking David Bakhtiari is the best in the league. Yeah. Uh Brian Bulaga has been a steady uh, presence when he's been healthy. Um everything inside has been the issue. Lane Taylor had a really uh, a below average year last year, but he also had injuries with his knees and his ankles and stuff, so he wasn't 100%. Corey Lindsley's playing above average to almost to a pro bowl level status. Yeah. And right guard was an obvious obvious hole that needed to be uh filled up this offseason and they did that. Um so, you know, it not lo- not pointing fingers at the left tackle, at the right tackle and the center, but everything in between. Yeah, the guards were an issue. Mm-hmm. So, so when we go off of the only numbers that matter, and that would be the uh, twenty, uh, the twenty twenty Madden NFL numbers. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys saw that at all. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think this just came up today or yesterday. Um, the uh, so Bakhtiar is our top three player player in Madden. In Madden. Um, and um, then the, the, the numbers, numbers numbers fluctuate over, over the years, the years, the years, 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 that update the stats according to the season. Um, so last year, uh, Rogers was a 99, which is the highest you can have. Mm. And over the course of the season, mm. they dropped, they dropped him down to a 91. He's starting the season this year at 90. Mm. Seems um, about right. I, I don't, yeah, I don't think I disagree. Um, he only, so, he, wait a minute. He only, he's a 99 is the highest you can get. And yeah. he was a 99 to start, and he only went down to a 91. Well, I mean, he is Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the other interesting thing is our second best player, according to Madden, uh, the Madden game, not, not uh, necessarily Madden himself, but uh, uh, Devontae Adams is number two with a 92 rating. So, mm. just whatever. whatever. Just since it's not my screen. Yeah. Well, you can't argue with Madden. Just that's, 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 that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So 
I think we can move on from that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, now we're on to the section where I call it's the Absolute Patriot Podcast because I always like to talk about things the Patriots do that are better than us, and I uh, am very jealous and a spiteful, petty person. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead and hop right on into that. So Greg Bedard is a uh, sounds like a blast. You really stopped to be. I know. You know. I'm just. I'm just. Being, full disclosure. Again, I sat through the petty cash up here. I'm down to there's nickels rolling around up in here. The rainy day fund is gone. Um, so Greg Bedard is a um, he's a beat writer for uh, Boston. He writes all the sports up there, professional sports. I think even maybe some college. But um, he wrote a piece about uh, basically kind of the Patriot way, and it I think it came out about a week ago or so. Um, and full disclosure on Bedard too, he used to be a beat writer for the Packers during Super Bowl year. I think he was here for like three or four years for the Journal Sentinel. So he has history with the Packers and. I've always like I I continue to follow him even though he left because I always he was an OBS guy and he loved you know he was he would call out stuff all over the place, but anyway this this um this article basically talked about the gist of it is this it was now granted let me preface by saying we're in a different era now we got a different general manager we got a new coaching staff so the philosophies are have, have basically changed over the past two years we moved on from Mike McCarthy and Ted Thompson now to Matt Lafleur and Brian Gutekunst but Nonetheless, um, the Patriots, you know, what what they 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 were a stark contrast to how they built their team and continue to um, versus the Packers in that, um, you know, they don't rely on rookies. They just don't. They don't put them in positions where they have to start or they're preordained starters or, you know, they just grant, give them the keys to the car, so to speak. They slowly move them all in and ask them to do very minimal stuff um, until they become experts at that. And then they move them in behind veterans and they, they plug them in when they're ready to go. Um, to me, that sounds like common sense. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why, you know, obviously with the way the Packers did under Ted and we don't have to rehash all that. And I'm not sure how much it's going to continue to be that way. It looks like it's changing a lot, you know, under Gutekunst pretty quickly, but um, you know, I just, I just think it's interesting how, you know, in a, in a, a league that is so, caught up on trends and copycatting, you know, I guess, you know, does it help to have Tom Brady? Yeah. Does it help to be Bill Belichick? Yeah. But still, um, it's interesting. So there, there's a quote here. I'd just like to, to kind of talk about real quick. Then I'll put it over to you guys. It says, and this is from Greg Bedard, um, Patriots draft picks, even if they're taken in the first round are not relied upon to start a season, unless it's a complete desperation at their position. If they have, you know, 10 injuries at tackle or something, um, this is very much by design. Good teams can take players in round one and develop them. The bad teams have to rely on them, said a team source. The bad teams have to rely on them, or in the case of the Packers, they were pretty good or have been pretty darn good, um, but they still rely on them. Um, so I think that in a way that's kind of interesting where the Packers didn't have to do what they did under in, during Rodgers' heyday, but they did it anyway. And I, so I'm kind of salty about this, and it's the damn Patriots. So you know, again. So what do you guys think? What do you think, Jeremy? What do you think, Elliot? I think that's every team's MO is to, you know, bring rookies in slowly and, and slowly get them used to the game. But right. I have to, I have to dispute um, some of his, and he obviously knows the team better, but I'm just thinking at the top of my dome. I mean, last year, Sony Michelle started right from day one um, and he was a first round pick, uh, a rookie, um, you know, Donta Hightower, their linebacker, um, Rob Gronkowski uh, started right away. Um, so there are there have been rookies um, that have started for them. I, even going back to when they played us in the Super Bowl, Willie McGinnis started his rookie year. Um, I, I have to question some of that. But uh, in general, I think every team wants to um, have a team around that the rookies can pretty much use the first year as a get to know you kind of a, a deal. Um, and that's how things would work ideally would want to work out. Uh, but the way that today, uh, ever since free agency took hold in 92, um, that has changed the whole game plan between teams because now teams um, are filling holes every single off season because you always have turnover and how you fill that you either dive into mm -hmm. free agency or you draft, um, you know, and hopefully those draft picks are playing. So it, it's, it's a different change. 
Um, if you're talking about the 90s, yeah, I would say that rookies tended to not play in their first year, but we're talking about 2019, and rookies are always going to play. Um, I don't care whether they're the Patriots, whether they're the Packers, um, you know, what one of the best teams, New Orleans Saints, rookies are always going to play, especially your higher picks. Um, you're forced to use them be- just because of numbers and schematics. So um, the way that the game has changed, uh, I don't think he's right or wrong, but I tend to disagree for the most part that um, rookies play right away and you have to because um, you have turnover every single off season and you have to fill those needs with who, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I you're right. I, I'm not an expert on the Patriots either. I guess, I, I guess I take what he's saying to mean is, you know, not a black and white thing. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, maybe they're just better at it. So it's not happening quite as much, you know, all these things like, you know, the difference between the best players and the worst players, it's a matter of, you know, inches literally in a lot of circumstances. So, sure. you know, you know, um, maybe they get, you know, 0.9 injuries for every injury we get. So they're able to do that at a slightly better pace. And that could be the difference. Right. Right. So, I mean, it, it, I think I think that uh, and and why is that? Why do we get more injuries? Is that because of the system? Is that because of the players? Is that, you know, so like, uh, you know, they're they're the Patriots that whatever they're doing is working. And uh, um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I would like to, to actually see the spreadsheet now. <laughs> yeah, that, I, was right. say, I, would, I would like to. <laughs> Yeah, to your point, I mean, it, I would like to see the actual data to back some of that stuff up. I will say this, too. You know, with, with Belichick, he's always mining the bottom third of that roster, and he's not filling them in with, with rookies, you know, if you're talking about, you know, during the season. And, and he's bringing in veterans nine times out of ten, constantly doing that kind of crap. Yeah. Um, and uh, which, a lot, which maybe it, allows him to not have to bring in those, those, those yeah. rookies. Yeah. And he's – it. Maybe it just seems this way with the Patriots again, but how many times do you see Belichick trading players that you'd never see traded? He mm-hmm. trades them. He trades them at the apex of their, and a right. lot of it more so for salary reasons. But the the way, anytime there's a trade and it involves the Patriots, somebody's getting fucked and it ain't the Patriots. <laughs> That's the, basically right, the way right. I look at it. You know, right, they, right. the geniuses that they're, you know, they're, they're trading the Richard Seymour's of the world. He's trading the Jamie Collins of the world. These, these players that are freaking all pros and he's trading them almost at their apex yeah, yeah. Um, to dump salary, but also to, to fleece other teams. Mm-hmm. So there mm-hmm. is this kind of, you know, I'll say it's like, it's, it's a, confluence of uh variables and whatnot but again you know i'm jealous of the patriots and i think there there's some truth to that now what jeremy said yeah they did start some other rookies and you do start rookies now more than ever but i would be willing to bet that the patriots in terms of team overall team age and who uh, the, the the players they mine um you know yeah. during the season whether it's injuries or whatever he's churning over the roster it's 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 always you know more so the veteran. And yeah. um, again, it helps to have Brady. It helps to have, you know, I think, you know, McDaniels is an unbelievable offensive mind too. And Belichick himself basically runs the defense. He's a great defensive mind too. So you have so many things working for you. But um, the, the the very interesting thing to me about it was it was basically the antithesis of how the Packers did it for so long, you know. Yeah. And the Packers, you know, they made it work. Rodgers got hot one year or whatever, but you can't tell me if you don't if you don't sur- surround Rodgers with more veterans and you mind and you and you sweep the bottom of the roster over the years and rather than filling in with rookies you don't know their ass from a hole in the wall it's not their own fault you know it's it's they're being put in that position it things wouldn't have been different you know that's I, that's what I kind of look at it as mm-hmm. I am a um I don't know so I'm going to try and, and, and make this be the absolute Packer podcast, not the absolute Patriot podcast. I always seem to have some one Patriot thing each time. <laughs> True. True story. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Okay. Um, so uh, last couple topics here, they're, they're kind of related, intertwined. Um, we have the looming CBA, you know, the, the 10 year agreement is going to be up next year. And like anything, you know, deadlines per action. And I guess they're starting to, um, you know, negotiate with it and whatnot. But uh, I think this is going to be contentious as all hell again. You know, the, the players 
Trumpers are getting wealthy, all that kind of stuff. I, I am of the opinion um, that the only way the players are ever going to get any real substantial change is if they strike, is if they hold out and do an actual mm-hmm. work stoppage and don't play games. That's mm-hmm. the only leverage they're ever going to have. The problem is I just don't see it that happening. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a too much risk for the players to take to be perfectly honest, just given how short the careers are and things of that nature. Um, but I think it's going to get nasty again. And Demora Smith, who's in charge of the NFLPA, I believe he's the representative. Um, he doesn't strike me as much, you know, seems okay, but I think they could probably do better. I mean, he was doing a lot of blustering during the, the last CBA and they got bent over the barrel players got screwed in the last cba yeah. if you ask me but again they on having these games and they just couldn't do it you know that, that was the big thing um and within the cba discussion um there's been more talk and they're bringing up again that the nfl wants an 18 game schedule i will never be in favor of that because it's going to water down the product more more people getting hurt but if the nfl can make more money they'll do whatever the hell it is so anyway yeah. open for discussion on this Yeah, I think I brought this up in our discussion before we talked Um, with uh, player or the players that are in the league. um, They are mandated a a full pension uh, if they collect three years of of league um, time. Yep. So right now, the average NFL player averages for a career of three point four years. They estimate that if they go to an 18 game schedule, this would put them at around two point eight years that a player will average in the league which will leave out many players away from the mandated pension that they are so due that's Um, amazing that's a great tidbit you know that was via espn i i read that uh there but um yeah you know the nfl is the richest professional sport out there uh there's no question about that um and they're looking to get richer um, can you uh, blame them? No, it's, it's, <laughs> that's just the way that our country is built, you know, but getting back to football, um, the players in the last CBA, I think I'll agree with you, Andy, they did get a little bit, uh, um, you know, a little bit of sand put on the wound, um, because they don't, they're not getting a 50, 50 mix of the, of the revenue sharing in the league. Um, it's right around a 52, 48 balance. So they're getting less than half of the profits that come in. Um, or the revenue that comes in, I should say. So the players are looking to be closer to a 50-50. They're also looking to protect the middleman, um, which is just like, you know, society, uh, the majority of the population is middle class. The same thing goes for uh, NFL. The majority of players are middle class. Mm. Um, and what, they're do, what they want to do, the, the players associated – players association the players they want to protect themselves they want to give these guys more guaranteed money because they don't want to see just aaron Rodgers and patrick mayholmes uh getting the guaranteed money they want to see um you know everybody from yeah. aaron Rodgers down to marquez valdez scantling or uh jay sternberger um you know they want to see everybody getting a, a, a fair share of the pie um you know, when I kind of read things, um, just kind of reading today, because this is the first time I really started reading about it, um, to me, it sounds like the players are not all for, um, you know, guys like Aaron Rodgers being paid as much as they are. They want it to kind of, you know, the, the, the wealth kind of spread out a little bit more mm. evenly. Um, and I guess I would agree, you know, but I, I, I'm, I'm also a firm believer that if you produce, you should get paid, just like anything. Um, but how much do they get paid? I mean... Like I said, Aaron Rodgers, after the first game of this year, will make $101 million since last year, since when he signed a contract before training camp. So um, that's a gross, to me, a gross uh, overestimation and a gross. Yeah, but that's only like $50 million after taxes. <laughs> Continue. I had to throw that in. I just had to. Sorry. It's closer, <laughs> to, th- closer to 30%. Uh, that's long story. I won't get into it. But um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it, you know, the players want, they're, they're really going to start bargaining hard to protect the middle player or the middle guy. Um, and, and even the bottom guys and the veterans as well. Um, veterans right now, if you have over, um, I think it's eight vested years, you're guaranteed a certain salary, uh, based off of your, um, time put into the league. 
they want to increase that because they don't want guys to be playing just because they want to make an extra buck. They want them to play because they love the game, you mm-hmm. know, and the people that want to step away, they should be able to step away. Um, but not everybody's able to do that because finances obviously play a role into that. But um, I know I went completely, not completely, but a little bit off topic, but uh, no, I think uh, it's all fantastic. This is a great discussion. You know, it, it's just, um, I, I think, I think the players, definitely have a point in saying that um you're i'm trying to think of a middle of the ground player at this point let's say josh jones for example middle of the ground player deserves to make his money um well he has to perform too so i don't believe that he should get the money you have to have some performance value so then i will i'll throw it up to say um uh brian bulaga does he deserve to get a new contract i mean he's proved it i mean he's you know, uh, his play has, when when he's been healthy, he's been one of the top right tackles in the league. So, um, you know, comparatively speaking, I think he should get paid because he's produced. Um, so that's going to be the interesting point. And it's good that they're actually starting to talk about this right now, uh, because like you said, we have one off season and then, you know, the, the contract is up. So they have to get a head start on it. Um, and everything that I've read so far from Demora Smith has pretty much said that talk, the talks have been positive. Um, but the one thing that kind of raised their eyebrow was this 18 game schedule. Uh, mm. Because this is the funny thing that I, I and this is the only way they're going to get it to sell. Um, but the funny part of this is not all the players can play 18 games. They can only play 16. Yeah, so that's, in, the Packers, in the Packers eyes, we would only see Aaron Rodgers 16 out of the 18 games, just to put it in perspective. Who wants to pay to go to a game if they're not playing? You know? know. So, you know, does is that going to work for the fans? No. I think fans would be ticked that they'll have to, you know, the season ticket holders especially, yeah. they'll be ticked saying, hey, I have to pay full season ticket value when I can't even see full value in the field? You know? Yeah. Is this going yeah, to is this going to turn fans away from the game? I think it could, you know? Yeah, I agree. And the NFL so desperately wants – They've been br- talking about an 18-game schedule off and on f- since the last CBA, mm-hmm. and maybe even before that. It's like they really, really want this because they really, really want the money. But the justification to do it, it just destroys the product, mm-hmm. and they just they. But they they want money, you know. And it, it's always a, I hate to say it, but it's it comes down to money, you know. In the league, I was I'm, I'm going to bring this up again. You know, I I, I had said before we started. Um, recording the actual podcast and maybe you heard this Elliot, but I said it to, to Jeremy, I said, you know, I love football, but man, I'm really starting to hate the NFL, you know, the way they treat mm-hmm. uh, the game and the, what they do, you know, at the expense of, you know, just, you know, all the, all the half the games are becoming on with all the flags and all this and that, and just all these things that are taking away from, from a good product on the field and in the name of money. And let's be honest, it's all in the name of money. Well, totally. And let, let's think about this. The biggest off-season hurdle uh, the past two off-seasons has been concussions. And now we're talking about extending the season? Yeah, no kidding. That, if <laughs> that's not fucking out of both sides of your freaking mouth, that's, right. you know, we're big on player safety yet. Right. Oh, we'll hold, you know, we'll hold player. They can only play 16. It's just, it's like a shell game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be devil's advocate. Do All right. It. Yeah, so uh, we're we're making this podcast. You know, we put it out. Um, we don't, you know, we don't get paid by any of the platforms that have this on on their their services. Some of them. I got a to... check in the mail the other day. You guys got yeah, it too, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, no. uh, yeah. I mean, so I mean, your underhanded uh, negotiations notwithstanding, most of us. Don't worry. Don't worry about. <laughs> check so. You know, so, you know, things go up on YouTube. YouTube makes, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, very profitable. And the creators don't get much of anything. It's it's no different on anything, right? So there there's a glut of people that are willing to work for next to nothing. Uh, and they love doing it. 
and I, I just see all this massive parallels, right, between these these platforms. The NFL is a platform, so uh, and and it is a platform because you gain the notoriety that allows you to gain other interns. So even these middle these middle players, these these the fat middle, the, the middle of the class of the NFL, you know, they they get out of there. They get they get you know newscasting careers. They get uh, careers in advertising. Or you know whatever whatever they're doing you know they gets it gets them in the in the door to ha- sure. for the potential to have sure. a second career right mm-hmm. um, and you know and that's what we're all sold on like oh you're gonna be a YouTube star you know whatever whatever right so there's just there's just this ton of people out there so what possible incentive does the NFL have to meet their demands none none they have zero yeah. S- st- go ahead and strike we will replace you. Um, you're, you're not the superstars, the superstars demand the, the, they're the ones that bring the people in. You said it yourselves. Like if, if the, if they increase the season to 18 games and you can't, you can't see Aaron Rodgers play, people are going to be pissed off. That is what puts the people in the seats. That's what sells the, the, the TV contracts is the big name stars. Uh-huh. And, and the, the, the middle class doesn't matter. They, they're, they're a rounding error. Mm-hmm. Um, and, Ooh, and so they're man. and so and so they're a rounding error on the negotiation table too, and they have to they have to realize a, a certain amount of that, and uh, you know, and of course they need to go in with their best foot forward, and they need to try to negotiate the best they can, but they they have to be realistic too. Um, the NFL is is an entertainment service, and they are up against unbelievable amounts of money just being poured into streaming services right now. Mm. And um, like, and there's just, there's just, there's talent out there that's willing to work for nothing. And the profit margins are going to be hit with the NFL. Potentially the, you know, the, the TV contracts are going to be coming up. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, I think they have to be really careful. I think they, they, they if they, they, they can uh, they can negotiate a, a lofty middle class pension just like Illinois did, and then they can the state can go bankrupt. You know, uh, I think you have to be really cautious about doing something that you just you don't see. Uh, you don't you know twenty years from now we don't see how that actually can work. Um, you know, and I, I don't even believe everything that I, I necessarily just said. I, I do I do agree with you guys on a lot of those things, but just the devil's advocate, like hardcore business view. Um, yeah, the NFL's greedy. Yeah, the owners are greedy. Yeah, the players are greedy. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of other choices for entertainment. And there's a lot of other players out there. So that's it, my piece. And I think that you you bring up some great points, Elliot. And uh, the point that I want to bring up now is just kind of a counterbalance. Um, I've been meaning to do a blog for months now about how the top paid quarterbacks perform with their team. Um, And I'm not going to give away the whole gist of my article, which I got to get out there, but over half of the top paid quarterbacks don't even make the playoffs. So um, if you don't protect your quarterback, which is the highest paid position in the league and your, your brand ambassador and everything, if you don't protect them with middle of the ground guys, they're going to be nothing and you make nothing. So that's why I go back to the middle class being taken care of because they're protecting the Aaron Rodgers, the Tom Brady's of the world. Um, they're making them look good because they're doing their job, True. you know? So, True. you know, no, that's, this is a great discussion. Um, I didn't see it quite going that way, but that's a good thing. Um, I think, you know, and maybe a little old, naive me or whatever there's there, there's this thing in the back of my mind or the, this i'm like i want to see more ethics <laughs> and just you know it's you're, you're not going to see it i mm-hmm. guess there's just something where you could see you know you hear like well what's how, how much money is enough money and you know the parallels between we'll say society government capitalism all that you know there, there's some interesting stuff going on and, and the the arguments for like you said jeremy i think that's a fantastic argument um, you know, the middle class of the NFL, um, there's haves and have nots in the NFL. There's haves and have nots in, in America. You know, there's, it, it, it's, it, it is very interesting. I, I guess me personally, um, like I said, I, it's almost like going back to like 
the crux for me is the the money isn't the root of all evil but man the the love of money is the root of all evil (laughs) i know that sounds kind of silly and cliche it's like um i don't know i don't have a magic answer um because everything you guys said makes sense you know even the quote devil's advocate article um arguments are just even bringing up they they make sense every everything I think it's we have to revisit to this. A bunch of holes in it and go, rah, 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 yeah. you know, it's. No, um, oh, but I would like to revisit this after you do your blog post. I think that'll be. Uh, yeah, I'm really curious to see that too, because that's going to. Yeah. Something like that, that's a really interesting way to um, break something down, you know, into something that's not just. It's stats, but it's stats beyond just football. You know what I mean? There's a lot well, of level, There's a lot of layers there, I think. Yeah, there is, but it brings perspective on how the league grossly overestimates how much a quarterback should be paid and how valued they are. Mm. Where, like I said, since 2011, um, you know, over half of the quarterbacks, the highest paid five highest paid quarterbacks per year, uh, did not make the playoffs. Um, and only one won a Super Bowl, which was Eli Manning. Uh, but that, um, it just goes to show you the gross overvaluation of the quarterback position in as a whole, how every team rides their hopes, their dreams, their seasons on a quarterback, mm. and they don't look at the rest of their team and they forget about that. And then you're in the position like we are, where we have probably the best quarterback in the league, but we don't have anybody, or I shouldn't say not anybody, we don't have the team around him to produce a winning result, and we missed the playoffs the last two years. So you have to look at the whole picture. Is it great to have a quarterback? Just like in baseball, you want a stud pitcher like Roger Clemens. You want a stud quarterback like Aaron Rodgers. But without a team in a team sport, you're going to be nothing. Tennis, you could be the best tennis player in the world because you're going against your opponent. But in football, in basketball, in baseball, in any team sport, the team has to perform and win as a team, not just one player. You know, so well said. Yeah, I, you know, um, I, I think that um, I think that the the top quarterbacks, I think, uh, or the top paid quarterbacks, to your point. Um, I think that they they caught what Eddie Van Halen uh, referred to as lead singer's disease. <laughs> LSD. Yeah, right. Right. Um, LSD. That's a that's a good analogy. I like that. Right. <laughs> David um, Lee. He's talking about David Lee Roth. Well, and, and, <laughs> and, and Hagar. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so like, uh, you know, because I just think about, yeah, like, uh, you know, like it, I, I, I was kind of let down that Aaron Rodgers got that huge contract. Maybe feel good, like okay, we have the best. We have that it validates that we have the best quarterback, I yeah, guess. guess. But like, couldn't we say like, all right, he's going to get this much money, but he's going to give it all back. <laughs> I keep going. You know? That's a good point, and I keep going back to maybe this. I don't understand the money structure and the cap and all that. I probably don't, but I keep going back to the freaking the Patriots. What did we yeah, say about yeah. Tom Brady and his salary structure? He's never yeah. been in even like the top 15 oh. for like over the past 10 years, if not. Now, are they playing, quote, games or moving his salary around or whatever? Maybe. I don't know all the ins and outs no. of that. But at the same time, he is the outlier. Yes. And, w- and what's happening is they're winning more. They're surrounding him with better players more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In Can't his career, that. in his career, I did. I don't know if I did a blog on this or not, but in his career, he's only been a, a top 10 paid quarterback once. Think about that. Once. And he's out of the top 15 most of the time. So he's right. he is, quote, maybe the best of all time, let alone the best right now, you know, him and Rodgers and whatever. And the guy's being paid as if he's, to Jeremy's point, in the, the middle to lower middle class. Mm-hmm. That's yep. It's fascinating to me. So I, along with everybody else, uh, want to okay. let Andy get to bed, and we want to read the <laughs> blog post. That blog post is That's at absolutepacker dot com, and uh, this podcast is available on YouTube. This podcast is available on. Uh, it's now called Apple Podcasts. It used to be called iTunes. Uh, mm-hmm. It is available on Google Podcasts. It's available on Overcast. You can go to AbsolutePacker.com. At scroll to the bottom, you can see all the places that you can play it. You can go to your little uh, 
uh, Echo Device, and you can say, hey, Echo Device, play Absolute Packer Podcast, and it will play. Uh, I have done this, and uh, nice. my, I, I hear Andy's uh, wonderful voice talking to me. <laughs> if, you say, if you say play Absolute Patriot Podcast, the same podcast oh, plays, too. <laughs> yeah. So don't say that. Yeah. So uh, that's that's uh, really all uh, we're gonna do because uh, Andy has to go to bed. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to watch I, him yawn anymore. And I. <laughs> nice. And thank you to our first interview of the season. Zoe. Thank yeah. you, Zoe. Yeah. That was awesome. That was cool. cool. All right. Uh, I'm gonna say go pack go. Go pack go. Go pack go. Podcast, podcast. Chair. I know, right?